Greetings everyone, welcome to an all new edition of the Golden Standard, the official comic book review series of the Golden Age 1942. We have got a huge episode of the Golden Standard ready for you today. So huge, so epic, you'll have to binge watch it in two parts. And that's perfectly fitting because today we're talking about the new binge book line of comics from the new publishing company Sit Comics. And folks, we are the only store in Tennessee that you can get these awesome books. So you're going to want to stick around and listen up. Joining us today all the way from Los Angeles, California on speakerphone, he is the publisher, creator, and writer of Sit Comics in the new binge book format, Darren Henry. Ladies and gentlemen, Darren Henry. Darren, thanks for coming out with us today on speakerphone. I am very happy to be with you. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, yeah, I'm hopeful that I'll be able to be there in person at some point this year. But in the meantime, I'm, I'm glad to get this chance to talk to everybody there. Yes, awesome. We're, we're so happy to, uh, to have you on the show today, and we're so excited about your line of comics. For those of you who don't know, Darren Henry is a television writer turned comic book uh, producer. He is the founder of Sit Comics, which is an exciting and unique uh, line of comic books uh, that we have. We're the only store in Tennessee that are selling these comics. We we're really excited, very honored to have them on our shelves. Darren, tell us a little bit about your background as a television writer. It was 1992 that I first uh, decided to drive to California to become a writer, and I was lucky enough to have been working in Pennsylvania in television and public television there. I had been a big Britcom fan and a Doctor Who fan, so that was what sort of put public TV on my radar as a younger, like, teenager and into my, you know, college years. So I sort of navigated to that TV station and, and found my way in there, and it turned out that the work I put in over the course of my years in college really paid off because right before I decided to move to L.A., I told some of the folks at that TV station that I had decided to write sitcoms, and they mentioned two people who had come through Harrisburg and who were there, at that time, um, working in Hollywood, and one of them was Carmen Finestra, whose show Home Improvement had just started the year before. You know, he actually grew up in that area of Pennsylvania near Harrisburg. And then he met the person who I worked with in Harrisburg mentioned one other name, and it was Tom Sharonis. And my eyes just totally lit up because that was the director of Seinfeld. And it turned out he also had come through that same TV station even before I was born. And... He had met his wife in the area, and he had still had ties to the area. And it turned out he was not just the director of Seinfeld, but he had a friend in common who was willing to call up and mention me as someone who might be worth uh, giving a chance in Hollywood. And it turned out that's exactly what happened. And within a few weeks of that conversation, I was on the set of Seinfeld. And within a few days of that, I got hired to be a part-time production assistant. So that's sort of my origin story as far as getting out to Hollywood. Obviously, I ended up doing a lot of different television shows over the course of more than two decades. I got actually staffed as a writer on The Muppets, which led me to be on Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld's radar as someone who actually was a writer as much as an assistant. And then I got hired by Jerry to write episodes in the last two seasons of Seinfeld. And then my career just has continued. And that's that's really the, the way into Hollywood is to just sort of have connections with people even mm -hmm. before you know that there are connections that could pay off later and you work really hard and and that uh, that was my sort of story of getting in, in the front door. You've basically taken your knowledge and your craft of, of, of TV writing and you've brought it into the medium of comic books uh, and you've uh -huh. in doing so you've created something new, something called the binge book. Now I can, I can tell everybody what this is but I'm going to let you go ahead and explain to us what the binge book concept is. Well, it's, it's, the idea is to give a complete story with everything that you buy. I mean, every, every other form of media is sort of gravitating toward this binge model where, you know, so, shows that may be produced over the course of six months to a year aren't actually put out and put on Netflix until they're all completed and then they could, an audience can just enjoy them all at once. And the other aspect of the binge book is the price. And, you know, just to finish that, the um, binge book that I publish, they are all self-contained stories. So as frustrating as sometimes comics can be where you serialize stories so that for the publisher's point of view, they can be put out 
in serialized form, but then they can sell them to the same audience again in the trade paperback. I sort of tried to make a, 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 a product that takes the best of both of those worlds, where you get the affordability and the and the sort of and the sort of format of a saddle stitch comic, but by giving 64 pages, you get the reading satisfaction of a trade paperback. The price that you pay, though, for a trade paperback is more than most general audiences would pay. It helps to be a fan. You you put up with things that most people wouldn't yeah. because you're a fan of that product or that that character. Mm -hmm. So you're willing to take those additional steps. But um, frankly, I don't think most people are going to do that now. So I, yeah. I definitely feel like my books are, are not just for comic book readers, but for people who just want to be entertained, yeah. whether they are familiar with comic book characters or not. Now, the price is another thing I feel very little of what people are consuming for entertainment is actually paid for. Individual products, I mean, like you don't pay for a TV show anymore, you pay for a subscription service that lets you watch one of mm -hmm. hundreds or thousands of TV shows or movies. And so you don't think of putting money into the purchase of any of your entertainment in other ways of consuming them. And comics just, they're sticking to this model that, you know, obviously works, I guess, for the publishers, but I don't think it really takes into account the changing world that we're living in and the way people are just trying to get their entertainment in, you know, the cheapest way possible and make it as good as it can possibly be and uh, make it as easy to access. And, you know, that's the idea behind the binge book is giving 64 pages of full color story and art for three ninety nine, which is making it like a three, three issues for the price of one. Yeah. And they are entertaining. Like I, like I said, I'm going to, I'm going to show off one of these books real quick. I got one of probably one of my favorites here is Z people. Uh, and folks, if you take a look at this, I mean, these things, like when you when you grab them off the shelf, like I said, 64 pages, like they're heavy. They are just chock full. And I'm just going to kind of flip through and show of just, like you said, no ads, uh, just nothing but beautiful artwork uh, that really energizes and tells the story in a fun way. You've got sit commercials in these things, and I think they're just, they're fun. Uh, and you get like a like a different little piece of artwork. It's like you're just you know, you've got so much content in this book. I applaud you for that. Uh, the sick commercials well, I really you. I really enjoy because it it kind of switches it up a little bit. You get something different. I've read all the titles that we have here in the store. I noticed that you know uh, the frequency of the sick commercials is kind of like they like in one of the books you you had like two or three in the middle of the book, and then you had uh, some at the at the end of the book. Is that something that you're kind of playing with, like the placement of the sit commercials? Well, I mean, it's harder to feel like the sit commercials, even though I do try to write for almost like it's I'm writing like a TV thing where I write for the commercial break and you try to give a good, compelling act break moment that will make you want to continue reading but also give you a, a sort of break in the action. Um, I'm finding that it's, it's less fun to have those in the superhero books. Mm -hmm. And so I don't necessarily feel like that kind of, the tone of the shit commercials is always humorous. Whereas the superhero books, I'm trying to, I have high concepts, sort of high concepts in a comedic way premises for the mm -hmm. superhero books, but they're not necessarily as easy to make them the fit with the um, straight out comedy of the commercials. Yeah, so yeah. They don't, it's just me figuring it out, as you say. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I also feel like I need to tell stories that if there are three acts, I try to get 20 pages per act because then I do not um, sell the binge books digitally, but I do break them into chapters mm -hmm. for digital consumption. Mm -hmm. So it's just one of those other things where if I want to give a satisfying digital chapter, I kind of need to give that 20 pages to mm -hmm. telling the story and not the commercial so much. So. It's, it's either, it's, it's, it's not that I won't be putting more commercials together. It's also a different com comedy muscle that I don't mm -hmm. necessarily have as much um, experience in. I'm used to telling full stories. And sometimes, you know, the idea of coming up with a commercial, it just takes a, a it takes that moment of inspiration. And I don't always have time to do that when I'm trying to get the other stories to make sense and to be entertaining as well. Now, there were, there were some sick commercials that seemed to, there were a couple that, that come to mind that uh, seemed to be like an advertisement for upcoming sitcomics. Were the, this is just the, me asking as a fan. Uh, were those real or were those were those fictitious? I think one of them was uh, something about some mice or something. Yeah, the lab mice. Yeah, um, yeah. That's a fun one. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, 
honestly, I could do more of that stuff. It just depends on... It, I think it could be a fun soap opera. Yeah. A comedy soap yeah. opera, but I'm not sure. I, it just is just where I want to put invest the time and money because, you know, I've always just been, up until I started publishing, I've been the person who, you know, my job is to entertain as many people as I can and I get paid by a production company. So I don't really have the same amount of control over what I end up putting on television that I have when I create my comics. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I do see their, their side of things as a, as a producer, you have to decide where you're going to put your money and your time. Mm -hmm. And you can't just do everything that you think is fun. You also have to sort of make sure you're not over committing to something that you don't necessarily have enough material to enjoy, make it, make it fully satisfying at a longer story. It's, it's really all just where, I feel like I can I can make the most bang for my buck and and get the get the audience um, a really good and entertaining product. I could see doing more of those uh, quick one pagers for the lab mice. Mm -hmm. I could see doing a lot longer story. It just depends on how how it sort of plays out. And I I, I try not to with the comics. Um, I try not to force myself to do anything. I try to just make the the best story that that I can. And uh, and let it take over as as it as it's developing. So have you have you always had a passion for storytelling? Yeah, I mean comics were definitely the first. You know, before VCRs and before the internet, the only way you could watch something again, at least in television, was to wait for a rerun. But at least with comics, that was like the only visual entertainment where you could control when and where you'd watch it, and then when you consume it. So I I was a big comic book uh, buyer. Um, I mean, I, I found them somewhere, like in department store three packs, I'd say, was the main way of getting them. The book and records that Marvel Comics had made um, also really captured my imagination. And I, I turned into a storyteller through comics. I mean, some of the earliest things I ever created were comic books that I'd drawn and, and wrote myself when I was like 9, 10, 11 years old. Yeah. So it was definitely it was definitely a way to express myself. I never had a real desire to to draw Spider-Man comics, even though I'd read them or Avengers comics. It was always about creating my own um, characters, and I still have all those comics, and they were all original characters. And I think that that has sort of colored why I'm I'm more interested in telling stories with original characters than with taking someone else's and just carrying the torch, as it were. And yeah, i got to say, with these, with the new binge books, I mean, that you've got out now with sitcoms, I mean, you've definitely got some some original characters. The way I like to describe it, yeah, I mean, there, there's there are, there's basically something for everyone in each of these sitcomics books. And even if it's a title that, you know, you think, well, maybe I might not be into that, I, I would encourage everyone to, to pick up something that, you know, for instance, I picked up Bloodsuckers. You know, I'm not much of a vampire guy. Uh, but I find it hilarious. There's something, there's something for everyone in each of these books. If you if you think outside your box, grab one of these books. Yeah, I, let me just speak yeah. to that a, for a brief moment. I feel like the um, the thing about what I've been doing over 20 years in television is I've always sort of tried to speak to all audiences. I'm I'm a very mainstream person when it comes to how I see how what I create should be consumed, and I. I don't really like to think of it as for any specific demographic or for mm -hmm. anybody. I just try to tell stories that I feel like if you actually invest time in them, mm -hmm. you'll get something out of them. And, um, you know, I think that um, I don't have any real strong opinions about comics as they are being done by other people, but mm -hmm. I do feel that to a certain extent that a lot of creators are just almost they're creating it for other creators to enjoy. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I don't, I think that they're trying to, go deeper or darker and, and challenge, you know, in ways that I don't feel like are as mainstream. And, you know, obviously that's great for people who enjoy them, but I don't, I don't feel like that's where I get my creative juices flowing. Mm. I try to get the, the, the stories that will have a broader audience appeal. Yeah, you've definitely succeeded in that, man. Like I said, each one of these books has a great story in it that you can really sink your teeth into. Uh, you know, no matter what the appeal is there. I also want to talk real quick about the, the artwork in these books. I mean, like I said before, the artwork is very uh, vibrant. Each each one is very unique to the story that's being told. Uh, you've got some really cool artists working on your book. Uh, you've got um, Jeff Schultz working on Bloodsuckers of, of Archie fame. Uh, Tom Richmond from Married with Children uh, and Mad Magazine. Uh, one of the questions I had was... Uh, did you did you have an idea of what 
artists you wanted to work on each book, or did you kind of did you go out and seek the artists and let them choose, or how did that go about? It was definitely intentional. Uh, pretty much every artist I had, I, I gave a lot of thought to before I approached them about it. I mean, there are some artists who I've not been able to get, but it's not like any of the people who are doing those those names you mentioned were people who I knew would be a perfect fit for the book that I'm doing. Yeah. Sometimes it takes me a little longer to re realize that that's the, the, the artist that I need. But, for example, Jeff Schultz, from the minute I came up with Super Suckers and said, let's make this a comic, I wanted that Archie style. And I went to the store and looked at what was, at that time, Archie was still publishing in that style. And I didn't, as um, you know, I looked at all the books that they were publishing, and the one artist whose style was the most, consistently beautiful and still funny and you know he made all the characters no matter what they looked like they were all attractive and i just felt like the cartooning was just <laughs> exceptional and jeff was the artist whose name was on all of those books so i got in touch with jeff and you know and we worked out a deal and and we put uh we put that book together and he's he's been like the um the workhorse of the, the, the line because he's always delivering material and he's he's consistent and he's been great not to say anyone isn't, but a lot of other artists aren't as uh, their schedules fill up in different ways. Mm -hmm. And even though when Jeff has another job, he, he was always, um, I, I, I couldn't keep up with him sometimes, yeah. which is a good problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and Tom Richmond sort of, when I, when I realized what I wanted was something that Mad Magazine TV and movie parodies, he was the name. And, and thankfully, he was also keen to, to, to do some more, to, to do a longer sort of format than he's been doing on those six or seven page mad magazine parodies yeah and ron friends and sal mm -hmm. i mean if i could have named the one artist whose style i've always sort of thought of when i think of marvel comics it's sal Buscema. yeah and um and i knew i wanted him involved and i knew his work with ron on spider girl so they were again a dream team and glenn whitmore who yes. Jeff introduced me to has been a, a, a superb partner with the way he's just able to color everything I get. And Marshall Dillon, who's mm -hmm. the letterer, um, he's done a lot more than just lettering. He's he's really put a lot of care into what I'm doing. Is uh, sometimes uh, it just blows me away of what he's able to do, and I don't always have a lot of long deadlines for him on on these books. So I've just been I've been super lucky, and I've got some more artists and other creators involved with upcoming projects that I think are going to be really exciting. I can announce that Roger Stern, who I'm sure most of uh, older comic book fans are very familiar with his name from his runs on um, Hulk and Spider-Man. Oh, wow. He did a very memorable run on uh, Spider-Man with John Romita Jr. I think, yeah. you know, he helped bring the Hobgoblin in. He and John Byrne have a long time collaboration. They did a memorable short run on Captain America. Roger Stern is co-plotting and scripting the Heroes Union book that's uh, going to be coming out. Um, and Ron Friends mm -hmm. is, is definitely penciling that. So we've got a pretty good group of, of uh, creators, and I'm, I'm excited to, you know, when I can, expand that roster and, uh, you know, keep keep doing that as well. Todd DeZago, if I'm, I'm not even sure, I've never heard him actually say his last name to me. Um, <laughs> he's a longtime collaborator with... Um, Mike Waringo, and, and he also does stuff with Craig Rousseau, who does Startup. Todd's jumping on board to co-plot and script uh, Startup number three. So wow. I feel like there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot more I want to do with this universe of, of superheroes, and, and uh, thankfully I've got good collaborators on that. That's awesome. That's